Hi, everybody. This is going to be a short lecture on community organizing and building. The process of, for this class, the process of community organizing and community building, it's important to understand prior to implementing an intervention. But it's not, good to re it's not required to incorporate organizing strategies in your intervention for this class or for your paper. It's just to give you things to consider as you enter your communities, some of which it's going to sound familiar and because we've talked about some of this as you've done the various steps leading up to where you are at in your interventions. It can be very beneficial when needing to get buy-in from community participants because as we've discussed, just because you have a brilliant idea, truly brilliant, it doesn't mean it's going to be well received by a community. So you have to rally the troops. And how you rally the troops is very important and may not be as easy as it may seem because your brilliance has to be communicated in a way that others understand. Not everyone is a health science major. So first of all, what is community? Well, community is a group of people who have common characteristics. It really can be any size. Communities characterized by membership, a sense of identity and belonging. It can have common symbol systems such as language, rituals, ceremonies. It has shared values and norms, or it has mutual influence, shared needs and commitment to meeting them or shared emotional connection, common history, experiences, and mutual support. It can be defined by location, race, ethnicity, age, occupation, problems, outcomes, or any other common bond. So examples of this, there are communities such as neighborhood associations, business associations, religious associations, religions, uh, there are racial groups, ethnic groups, 12-step groups, there are sexual identity groups, sexual orientation groups, there are uh, heritage groups, uh, there are hobby groups, you name it, there is a group that has elements that have just been described that provide this sense of community to people who seek elements that have been described. And, and within that is a, is a sense of community. So if you wanted to organize something within a community, we must make various assumptions about community organizing. These are the assumptions that are generally made. That first of all, any community can develop the capacity to deal with their own problems. People want to change, and they can change. That people should participate in making changes. That self-imposed and self-developed change is more lasting. And holistic is preferred over a fragmented approach to change. That democracy requires a cooperative participation. And what that really means is that a community-based participatory approach to change, where someone perhaps from a university and community participation, together addressing the needs and together implementing change, um, that is cooperative participation, and that is democracy, rather than someone coming in from a university, let's say, or a hospital research laboratory, and simply dumping an intervention or requiring it by public law. Uh, that 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 members had no real input on. Communities need help with problems just like individuals do. Now, there's no single unified model, though there are several methods. 
Um, three categories of organization include locality development, and that is a way to seek community change through broad self-help participation from within the local community. This is a ground, grassroots, ground up way of building a sense of community. There's social planning, which is task oriented. It's focused on problem solving, usually with the help of an outside expert. And there's social action, which is both task and process oriented. It's larger, usually in scope, and it's trying to achieve change to redress imbalances in power. For example, the civil rights movement and the gay rights movement are great examples where you had task and process oriented actions and you were changing the balance in power. Now, the following slides are actually one long sort of flow chart. But off on the left-hand side uh, is the summary. So first, in, in the process of community organizing and community building, we have to recognize the issue and gain entry into the community. And in order to gain entry into the community, we have to negotiate the entrance with the gatekeepers. Who are the gatekeepers? Well, these will be your allies, your partners, these are the respected community leaders. They can be anybody. A gatekeeper could be, there's no necessary, not any one profession or title or job. It could be as much a house uh, person, a housewife or a uh, heralded father, or a, it could be anybody within a community as long as they have the respect and following and leadership qualities that are necessary to basically partner with you and vouch for you and allow you and, and help you establish trust within that community. Remember, your idea, which is so brilliant, uh, we need to get buy-in. So we'll come back to that in a moment. But those are the gatekeepers. That's someone who's going to be your partner and ally and allow you to gain entry into the community. And then you begin organizing the people. Then accessing the community. Uh, once you've accessed the community, we need to determine the priorities and setting the goals, arriving at a solution and setting an intervention strategy. And part of that process is mapping community assets. We've done that a little bit in class already. Um, we are going to talk here in community organizing and community building about building blocks, primary, secondary, and potential. And I'm going to show you and talk about that in a moment right after this flow chart. But again, what is in the com community capacity is what is in the community, what's in the community's control, or what is partially in the community's control and available to the community. Finally, once the priorities and goals have been set and an intervention has been selected, implementing the actual plan, evaluating the outcomes of the plan of action, maintaining the outcomes within the community, and most importantly, looping back. And that could go back right back to assessing the community. Uh, again, you're constantly working with the community, staying in touch with the community, keeping tabs on the priorities and goals of the community, making sure that everything is still relevant to the community. The priorities, the goals, and the interventions are still actively working within the community. Now, who do you want to organize well there are different groups of participants to organize so they it almost is uh, it's an almost logical but again we'll divide them up we call them executive participants these are a sm very small committed core group of leaders uh, the leaders the coordinators these that's the, the these people come from that group the executive participants group uh, usually your gatekeepers would be one of your executive participants Active participants, these are the worker bees. These are the people willing to work. 
they may also include your executive participants. Then you have your occasional participants. Now they're involved more on an irregular basis, maybe just when decisions need to be made, or, or, or a volunteer who just doesn't have a regular schedule and in and but is still there and working on a part-time basis or you know when whenever they're available depending on their other life commitments uh, very very important because they add to the manpower base then you have supporting participants. They're seldom directly involved, but they participate in other ways, such as financial or other resources, in-kind resources, such as the, the, uh, the donating space, donating labor, donating any resources they have that you might need to help in your plan, in your organizational efforts, and all of this comes together, it may form a coalition, which is a formal long-term alliance of individuals representing groups who agree to work together. You may actually find that you have several groups that are already in existence. You may have four different neighborhood associations that you bring together as a coalition all over the same issue. That becomes a coalition. They all agree to work together, all towards one goal. Now, we talked about that neighborhood asset map. Again, something you should be familiar with since we've done our windshield and our intercept surveys. And our, our um, we've, we've, we've done this already in our class. But we're going to take it from a slightly different approach. And we're going to talk about the building blocks, primary, secondary, and potential. And here you'll see we've structured a map based on whether it's a primary building block, which is in the center of the map. And those are the community assets that are right in the neighborhood that are directly under the neighborhood control. For example, religious organizations, citizen associations, home-based enterprises, personal income, right in the community, completely under community control. Then you have secondary building blocks. These are assets right in the community, right there, but they're largely controlled by outsiders. For example, the police department might be controlled by the county, uh, the fire department, libraries, public schools, report to a board, a unified school district, you know, a higher level, something outside of the community. Hospitals, Kaiser, for example, may be right in your community, may have obligations to serve your community, but yet reports outside the community. CSUN may be right in Northridge, does much public service for Northridge, is a resource, an asset of Northridge, but also reports all the way up to the state. And finally, potential building blocks, such as capital improvement expenditures, block grants from the federal and state governments, uh, foundation support, uh, the, uh, welfare expenditures. These are uh, resources that are completely outside of the neighborhood and completely controlled by outsiders. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this slide simply uh, tells you what I just said. <laughs> so there you have it. Again, what is in red are things that you should be paying specific attention to that you might be tested on. Uh, and again, this is not for incorporation into your paper. Far more important uh, in the future. But again, this is uh, good for you to know because uh, when you run your interventions in 445 and in your careers, you absolutely uh, must be able to get into and in the buy-in of a community and know how to, this is a core function of a health educator, uh, to be able to do community organization and community building. So this is your introduction. When I return on Monday, 
uh, we will have time for questions and any discussion that you would like on this topic. It is a very fascinating topic. It is a fun topic. It is actually one of my favorites. And I'm sorry that we aren't spending more time on it, but this is hopefully you'll have a class just on this topic alone at some point in your careers. Thank you very much for listening.